Well, hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to church this morning. Come on, can you put your hands together and welcome all those that are joining us online at our other campuses and in the jails. Can we welcome them to church this morning? Amen, amen. Well, I am so excited and honored to be here to share God's word with you all today. For those of you that I do not know or have not had the opportunity to meet, my name is Willie Gilliard, and I have the incredible privilege of serving as the campus pastor at the Fruitville campus, and I'm so excited to be here with you all today. And I'm honored to share God's word, but I cannot let this moment pass without giving honor where honor is due. And I just wanna take a moment and honor our incredible lead pastors, Pastor Randy and Pastor Amy, for just their incredible leadership, their dedication, their commitment. Can we give it up for our lead pastors today? Well, you all know if you've been here, we're in the middle of our pause series. And I love, love, love our pause series. But for me personally, I have not always loved to pause in my own life. I haven't always loved to take those moments and to just pause. For me, I'm a goer. You're gonna find out today. I'm a goer, I'm a mover. I like to be busy. I love to be with family and friends. I love to be doing stuff. And I've always kind of thought that when I took moments to pause, I kind of just felt like I was being lazy or not just using my time effectively. And so pausing in my own life wasn't something that I was really good at. And I was getting ready to go on my first ever three-day spiritual retreat, which is where you get away by yourself and connect with God. And I was excited for connecting with God, but I was not excited for being alone. I was not excited for being by myself. And so it was set up where I was gonna go spend three days at the beach. Now, I know what some of you all are thinking right now. You're like, three days at the beach by myself? That is my dream, right? But for somebody that loves to be with people all the time, it was like, I I was a little anxious about it. But I was like, well, hey, I'm going to the beach, right? I'm going to the beach, so at least I'll get to have my time with God, and then I'll get to people watch, I'll get to connect with people, I'll get to meet with people, I'll get to hear people's stories. And I walked out on the beach where I was staying, and I looked to the right, and as far as my eyes could see, now right now I can't see up close real good, it comes with age, but I can see real far away. Not a soul in sight. So then I was like, Lord, please let there be people to my left. And I looked to my left, Not a soul in sight, absolutely nobody. And it was kind of like the Lord said, Willie, I just need you to pause, be alone for a little bit, and just be reminded that you need to be still and know that I am God. And my prayer for us today, whether you're here or no matter whether you're joining us, that we can pause our minds for just a moment, we can pause our to-do list, we can pause our worries, we can pause our conversations, we can pause whatever we are thinking about that we need to do, and just be still and know that He is God and receive what He wants you and I to receive today. And if you are ready to receive God's Word, can you just give Him some praise? So will you all join with me if we just take a moment and pause as we go to God in a word of prayer. Lord, I just come to you so grateful and so thankful, so honored. Holy Spirit, I want nothing done here today other than what you want to be done. So I just surrender every single word that falls off my lips. This isn't, there's no power that I can bring to change anything. It's your word that is the life changing, powerful word of God that changes our hearts. So Lord, I pray that our hearts, minds, and souls would be open to receive everything that you want us to receive today, God. And Lord, that we would just be able to uh, receive what you want us to receive, hear what you want us to hear. And I just pray that I speak what you want me to speak and do what you want me to do. So we give you this time, Holy Spirit, and we thank you for no matter where we are hearing this message, we just thank you for each and every heart, mind, and soul that is joining together today to receive your word. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. amen, amen. Well, I'm so excited as we continue with our pause series. Now, I like, uh, I'm, I just want you to know right off the front, like I get really, really excited and passionate about God's word. I'm not mad at anybody. I'm not yelling at anybody, all right? It's all in love. But I'm excited for this pause series as we've been studying the book of Ephesians. Because if you've not been around, we've already gone through Ephesians one through four. 
And I wanna encourage you, if you haven't heard those messages, go back online and check those out. But we have had an opportunity to build a strong foundation of who God is, who God is, what God has done, what he's doing and what he will do. We've learned all about through Ephesians one through three that in Jesus Christ, we are chosen, we are adopted, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. We've heard all about God's grace and how much he loves us and the grace that is available to us through the blood of Jesus Christ. We've heard about the immeasurable and more power that comes from God. And then last week was a turning point in Ephesians. Ephesians one through three is all about who God is and a foundational belief of that. And then Ephesians four through six it's all about how it should change the way in which we live now that we know the truth of who God is and what he has done for us. It should transform the way that we live. And so today we're gonna be picking up in Ephesians 5. And as we do that, I wanna remind you that Paul wrote this to the believers in the city of Ephesus. So this was written to believers, followers of Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Ephesians 5. If you have your Bible app, you can turn to Ephesians 5 but we're gonna be starting with Ephesians 5, verse one. And it starts off with two simple words, imitate God, imitate God, as if that we could just stop right there and have an, an entire year series on that. But it says, imitate God, and then it doesn't stop there. It says, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us, and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. It says, imitate God in everything that you do. Imitate God in everything that you do. As I was studying, I took some moments and I went and looked in some different versions to try to find one that said, imitate God in a few things you do. Imitate God where it's easy for you to do. But you know what I could not find is anything that said where it's easy or where it's simple. It says, imitate God in everything that you do. So I looked up the definition of everything. Everything means all things. So imitate God in all things that you do. And what I wanna encourage us as believers is not to partner with what the world does. We want to try to change things to make it easier for us. But there is one thing that should never be changed. There is one thing that should never be manipulated. There is one thing that should never be tried to change what it says to make it easier easier for us. That is the word of God. This word is life. This word is inspired by God. This word is truth. This word is love. And this word will change your life when you apply it to your heart, mind, and soul. So it says, imitate God in everything you do. Not in a few things, not in the easy things. Imitate God in what you say. Imitate God in how you act. Imitate God in how you treat others. Imitate God in the way that you live your life. Imitate God in everything, in all things that you do. That means that there's not an area of your life, there's not an aspect of your life that is excluded from imitating God. Imitate God in everything that you do. And then he goes on and he says, in the next part of that that we just read, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ, who offered himself as a sacrifice for us. He says, we are to live a life filled with love, but that love that we're to live a life filled with is following the example of Christ. So we're to love as Christ loved. We are to love as Christ loved. And not with just a little bit of love, it says, I need you to live a life filled with love, a life filled with not love, not some love, not a little bit of love, not a, just a, a small aspect of love. He says, I need you to live a life filled with love. And that love that you are to live your life with is to be modeled after that of Jesus Christ. Where how did Jesus model his love? He gave his life for us. He sacrificed his love for us. He died on the cross for us. So Jesus modeled a sacrificial love for us. So if we are to live a life filled with love, modeled after that of Jesus Christ, then we should love others before we love ourselves. We should think about others before we think about ourselves. We should serve others before we serve ourselves. We should show others kindness. We should show others gratitude. We should show others humility. We should show others gentleness. We should love as Christ loved, which means we have to forgive others as Christ forgave us. He says, imitate God in everything that you do and love as Christ loved. Love as Christ loved. 
And then he goes on and he says, because of these things, there needs to be some change in your life. He says in Ephesians 5, three through four, let there be no sexual immorality and purity or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. I've seen stories, foolish talks, coarse jokes. These are not for you. Instead, everybody say instead. instead. One more time, say instead. instead. Let there be thankfulness to God. He's very clear and he says, let there be no let there be no more sexual immorality. Let there be no more impurity. Let there be no more greed. Let there be no more obscene stories. Let there be no more foolish talks. Let there be no more coarse jokes. And he says, these things are not fitting for God's children. And now as believers, followers of Jesus Christ, as children of God, he's saying these things no longer fall in line with who you are. Those are the things that existed before, but now I'm telling you, let these things be no more. Let these things be no more. And what I love about this is he was, Paul was warning them then, then and he's warning us now. If this word was for believers then, this word is for believers now. The word of God was the same and the standard was the same then, and the word of God is the same and the standard today. It does not change. So he was speaking to believers then, and he was saying, let there be no more of this in your lives. But we have to, as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, we cannot be as the world does and say, well, you know what? Like, I'm gonna allow a few of these things. I'm just gonna come up right to the, to the boundary line. I mean, I, I love them. I mean, we've been dating for all these years. It says, let there be no more sexual impurity. Let there be no sexual immorality. Let there be no more greed. Don't desire things more than what you desire God's presence. And he's saying that these things, whenever I think about my own children, I don't tell Presley and Jaden, hey, I don't want you going and touching a hot stove. I don't want you like speeding down the road at 200 miles per hour, not because I'm trying to keep something from them. It's because I'm trying to protect them because I know what's greater for them and I know what's safe for them. God is not trying to keep something from us. He's trying to give something to us. And he says, let there be no more of this among God's people because God's word and God's standard is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So if it says, let there be no more of this, there should be no more of this. But he says what we can do instead, instead of these behaviors, instead of these things that are not fit for God's children, instead of these things being a part of your life, let there be thankfulness to God. Let there be thankfulness to God. I love if we take a moment and we study what this does, if we focus on God's goodness, wherever you are, wherever you're joining us here or one of our campuses online at the jails, if we will just take a moment and focus on God's goodness, if we will focus on his love, on his mercy, on his grace, on his provisions, on the forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ, it allows our hearts to fall in line with God's will. And as we continue to be thankful to God for who he is, as we continue to be thankful to God for what he's done, what we will find out is our mind will begin to focus on the things of God and it will focus less on the things of this world. It'll focus less on the temptation. It'll focus less on the sinful desires as we have a thankfulness to God that lines up with his will. I have not always done this great in my own life. I remember a moment and a time when Jessica and I were going through one of the most difficult times is when she lost our second baby. And she ended up having a, a tube that ruptured and I was getting her to the hospital and I got her to the hospital and all that rang in my mind were the words, she has a lot of internal bleeding going on and we don't know what this outcome's gonna look like. We don't know whether she's gonna make it or not make it. And I watched as they just let her sit in a, in a wheelchair and she was starting to pass out. And then they finally got her in a room, but I saw nothing being done. I saw her crying. I saw her screaming out in pain. I saw her throwing up. I saw her going through all these things. And all of a sudden, all the words and the actions that flowed out of me in that next moment did not honor or glorify God in any shape, form, or way. I remember I began to lash out at the doctors. I began to lash out at the nurses. I remember saying like, you went to school to do this and I don't see anyone helping her. If you can't do it, find me somebody that can. Do you not remember what you, I mean, the words were harsh. They were, they were demeaning, they were belittling. There was nothing about it that was building up others. 
And I remember just then, all of a sudden, my anger and frustration, it shifted from, the, from what was going on there. And then I began to put that on God. God, if this is what's gonna happen, if you're gonna take her from me, I don't know that I wanna do this whole God thing anymore. And then all of a sudden, it was like, sometimes he's just gotta do it. The Lord just slapped me with this word. Now, I'm not saying take your Bible and slap somebody with the word. That's not what I'm saying. I know some of y'all, wherever you're at, you're wanting to do that, right? It's not what I'm saying. The Lord got me. And all of a sudden, I was reminded of 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. And as I began to hear that word, I began to ponder on that word. I began to focus on that word. All of a sudden, I just began to shift my perspective. And I began to say, Lord, thank you so much for every moment that you have given me with my incredible, beautiful wife. Lord, thank you for these doctors and nurses who you have given the wisdom and the knowledge and the ability to be able to know how to treat her medically. Lord, thank you for not letting me get pulled on the way here as I was speeding. And thank you for keeping us safe on the way here as I probably was driving recklessly. Lord, thank you for your love. God, thank you for your mercy. God, despite whatever happens here today, you are still good and you are still faithful. And all of a sudden, as I begin to let myself give thanks to God, my perspective and my focus shifted on what was happening and focused on his goodness. You want to know how to let there be no more of these things in your life today? Let there be thankfulness to God. Thank God for the strength that he gives you to turn away from that temptation. Thank God for the strength that he gives you to pursue him with your whole heart. Thank God that he loves you. Thank God that he saved you from that place of darkness. Just begin to thank God and to praise him and to give thankfulness to him. Can we just do that right now and just praise God for his goodness? I want you to understand that Thanksgiving is not just an alternative to the things Paul says, let there be no more of but it's a lifestyle that reflects the transformative power of God's incredible word. So today he says, let there be thankfulness to God. And then he goes on in Ephesians 5, six through nine. He says, don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Don't participate in the things these people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have a light from the Lord. So live as people of light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. The light of Christ within you produces only what is good and what is right and what is true. The presence of Jesus within you produces only what is good, only what is right, and only what is true. So we are to live as people of light. We were once darkness. It tells us we once were darkness. We once were living in darkness. But as we accepted the truth and we received the truth and we're now walking in a relationship with Christ, we are to live as children of light. We're no longer to partner with these things. It says at the very beginning, don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins. Don't participate in the things these people do. It says, don't be fooled by them and don't participate in them. Don't try to justify them and don't try to just be like, well, I'm just becoming a small part of them. But I think it's so easy that we could misunderstand what this is saying. It's not saying that we quit reaching out to those that do not know Jesus Christ. It just says, don't participate in the things that they're doing. No longer be a part of that sin. No longer participate or justify the wrong behaviors. I remember when I first gave my life to Christ and I was on this journey. And to be honest with you all, I didn't, I, I, as I was new and I was trying to live as, as the child of the light, I didn't really know how to like just be bold in it. And my lifestyle came from a lot of addictions, a lot of a partying, a lot of like things that I should never have been a part of. And I remember when I first gave my life to Christ, and I'm not saying this is, just understand, this is just my journey. God's taught me a lot since then. But I remember I was like, I don't, Something's different in me, right? So when I accepted Christ, I was like, I don't wanna participate in these things anymore, but I want the people that I love to know about the God that I love, and I wanna share about the God that I love with the people that I love, but I don't know how to be around these things and not participate in these things. 
And for me, I just wasn't strong enough yet. So every time I got around people that were doing things that I shouldn't be doing, I was just like, I'm on antibiotics, I can't do that. And so I was just like, that was my answer. I was like, I'm on antibiotics, I can't do that. And they're like, how long have you been sick? And I was like, well, I'm healed now. Let me tell you about the love of Jesus Christ because he was antibiotic to heal me, right? But it says that we're to no longer participate in these things, that we are to live as children of light. So when we step in, there's two things that cannot coexist together, light and darkness. So we, as children of light, the moment we step into the darkness, we want to let the light of Christ shine. We don't want to let their darkness be a part of what we do, but we want to let our light shine upon them. So it says no longer justify these things, no longer excuse these things, no longer be a part of these things, but everything that we do should be measured to the standard of God. Everything that we do should be measured and lined up with this word. If it doesn't line up with this standard, don't try to justify it. If it doesn't line up with this standard, don't try to excuse it. Because he says, don't be fooled by the things that by those who try to excuse these sins and don't participate in them. For the light of Christ that is within you, we are to live as people of light. And we're to let that light shine upon everything that we do. We're to bring the love of Christ into the midst of darkness where that darkness can be dispelled. And then it goes on. And I love this. This is probably my favorite part of Ephesians 5. And I apologize in advance because the scripture that I'm about to share with you gets me so excited that I don't know how to contain the excitement. That's the only thing I know how to say. I don't know how to contain it because what we're about to read, it changed my life. It transformed how I read this word. It changed how I understand this word. And it changed what it was, that me understanding how it was that God had called me to live. Ephesians 5, 15 through 20 says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. I do wanna take a moment and pause there. Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. Don't live like fools, those that don't know the truth, those that are walking in darkness, but live like those who are wise. I want you to understand something. This may have never been told to you today, but I want you to know that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit lives within you that we're gonna talk about, you may have never heard these words. Maybe your husband hasn't said it to you. Maybe your wife hasn't said it to you. Maybe your parent hasn't said it to you. Maybe your friends haven't said it to you. But if you are in relationship with Jesus Christ, you are wise. You are wise because his spirit lives within you. And it says, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. He says, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Every opportunity that you have to share is love, share it. Every opportunity that you have to show humility, show it. Every opportunity that you have to give kindness, give it. Every opportunity that you have to speak truth, speak it. Every opportunity that you have to share about the transformative power of the love of Jesus Christ, don't miss one opportunity. Let every opportunity be taken. Even if you're inconvenienced by it. Sometimes I felt like I have conversations with the Lord and I was like, Lord, I had a plan and you just totally interrupted it. And I feel like the Lord, he like wants to slap me with it one more time, right? Make the most of every opportunity in these days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, everybody say instead. Say it one more time. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instead of acting foolishly, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instead of participating in these things, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Make the most of every opportunity that you have by being filled with the Holy Spirit. He says, instead of all these things, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Come on, if you're grateful for the power of the Holy Spirit, can you give some praise today? 
The reason why I say this gets me so excited because when I begin to understand the power of the Holy Spirit, when I begin to understand who the Holy Spirit was, when I begin to understand what the Holy Spirit does, when I begin to understand how he speaks to me and how he operates in and through me, when I begin to understand what this word said about the Holy Spirit, I realized that I did not have to live this new life according to my own power, but I got to live it according to the power that is within me, which is the Holy Spirit. I don't have to do it on my own. It says in here, can I tell you what it says? In Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1, we studied the first week. It says, when we, we accepted Jesus Christ, when we heard the truth and we received the truth, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. We were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Listen to what John 14, sorry, I just gotta go right back to it because it just moved away, right there it is. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But listen to this, but as believers, you know him for he lives with you and he will be in you. He lives with you and will be in you. He lives with you and will be in you. When I look at what this word says, you know what it tells me about the Holy Spirit? In John 16, it says, he guides us in to all truths. In Acts 1.8, it says, he gives us power. In 2 Timothy, it says, he gives us power, love, and self-discipline. In John 14.26, it says, but when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything, and he will remind you of everything I have told you. That is what the Holy Spirit does. So if you're trying to let there be no more of these things, and it says to live as the wise live, don't live as the fools live. Can I tell you how we do that? We lean into and we trust in the what the Holy Spirit is telling us to do. It says that he will guide us into all truth. He gives us power. What does the Holy Spirit do? do? He convicts us. What does the Holy Spirit do? He guides us. What does the Holy Spirit do? He empowers us. What does the Holy Spirit do? He loves through us. What does the Holy Spirit do? He gives us strength. What does the Holy Spirit do? He gives us self-discipline. We can live how this word says to live when we trust and lean and depend on who the Holy Spirit is because it's his power within me. It is his power within me, not my power, his power that is within me. And I'm here to tell you right now in this moment, I want you to understand I'm not saying anything else. I can say nothing that can change what God wants to do in your life. But this word is truth. Nothing about this word, it contradicts anything. It doesn't contradict itself. So if he's saying, let there be no more of these things in your life, what I want you to know and what I want you to understand is that with the power of the Holy Spirit, you can imitate God in everything that you do. With the power of the Holy Spirit, you can love as Christ loved. With the power of the Holy Spirit, he will give you the self-discipline so there will be no more of those sins in your life. With the power of the Holy Spirit, he will change your heart and your perspective to give you an attitude of gratitude where you can give thankfulness to God and all of a sudden you fall in line with God's will for your life as you begin to thank him. With the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do everything that God has called you to do. And I wanna encourage you today, I don't know where you are, here, one of our campuses online in the jails, you may be saying, well, my life doesn't really reflect that today. Can I tell you, if you're here and you're hearing the word of God, that means you're living and breathing. And today, that all can change. You don't have to walk out of here today trying to say, how do I live this new life? How do I live as a child of light? Because it tells us in here, what we have to do in order to live according to the new life. He says not to be foolish, but to walk in wisdom. The Holy Spirit reminds us, guides us, and steers us in all truth. I don't know where you are today, but what I know is that God loves you. What I know is that God is for you. What I know is that he sent his son to die on the cross so that you could have a relationship with him. What I know is that if you are a child of God, that he wants something different than what it looked like before you began to know him. You once were of darkness, but now you live as a child of light and he wants you to walk in that light. What I know 
is that Christ loved you, Christ died for you, and Christ wants relationship with you. So I wanna ask you wherever you are, whether you're here joining us online, at the jails, at the campus, can you just take a moment and bow your heads for just a second? We wanna pause and go to God in a word of prayer. So Lord, we just come to you right now, so grateful, so thankful, and so honored for the power. God, thank you for the power that lives within us as followers and believers in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your grace. Thank you that you are for us and not against us. Thank you that you never leave us, you never forsake us. And right now, I just wanna take a moment, wherever you're joining us and wherever you are, if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, I want you to know that everything that is in God's word is a love letter to you. Everything that is in God's word is inspired by God. And his word says that if we confess with our mouth and believe with our heart that Jesus Christ is son of God, that he is faithful to forgive us of all unrighteousness. And right now in this moment, there may be some things that there needs to be no more of in your life. And God says that as we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he, re, he forgives us of those things and he sends the Holy Spirit to live within us. So right now, if that's you, wherever you are, I just wanna ask you on the count of three, just to lift your hands where you are. One, two, three, just raise your hand if that's you. Amen, amen, amen. Those of you that just raise your hand and together as a body of believers, wherever you are, can we just say these words out loud? Say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Today, I confess with my mouth and I believe with my heart that you are the son of God. Today, I choose you as my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, everybody says amen, amen. Come on, can we just take a moment and give God some praise? So I wanna ask nobody to leave because I, I want us to take a moment and I'm just gonna ask you to stand where you are because I wanna go back to the end of the scripture. And it says, instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. And listen to what it says, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves. And I really love the Lord and his sense of humor. He says, and making music to the Lord in your hearts. Thus for those of us that can't sing on tune. He wants it just to say right here, right? <laughs> and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's my prayer, what I'm asking us to do right now as a church, not to rush to breakfast or to rush to lunch, but we're gonna take a moment. And he started it off with said, instead give thanksgiving. He ended it with and give thanks for everything. And he says to sing songs of praise. And so what we're going to do is we're gonna have a little praise party in here this morning. We're gonna have a moment where we praise God for his faithfulness. We're gonna have a moment where we praise God for his goodness. We're gonna have a moment where we praise God.